podcast if I'm doing. Okay, thanks. We're all ready to get started. Okay. Hi, good morning, everyone. Uh, this is Megan Parker with the New York Association on Independent Living. Thank you so much for joining us for Niall and C.D. Panny's Joint Budget Advocacy Day opening session. Uh, we have a lot to get to this morning and a lot of legislators to hear from, so we want to get started. Um, and let's start uh, first with uh, Assemblywoman Aileen Gunther um, uh, to speak to us today. Um, about fair pay for home care and uh, other issues important to the disabilities community. Assemblywoman, over to you. Good morning, everybody, and thank you for holding this meeting today. And um, I first of all, uh, okay. Good morning, everybody, and thank you for inviting me to this meeting today. Um, uh, as you know, I represent a, la a large group of people that are in, um, in, in this category, um, the, and we all strive for independent living. And uh, first and foremost, I think that the most important thing that we can do to basically a woman-dominated field is to make sure that COLA happens. I mean, we've been waiting and waiting and they give us increases in dribs and drabs. And right now we know how important it is, number one, for the people that have gone through this pandemic and have taken care of people in this community and made sure that they had food and they were safe at home and, uh, and we know the importance of that. And in order to encourage more people to enter this field, we have to increase salaries across the board. It is vitally you know, important. 
Um, and I will be working towards that goal. I know a goal. I know that uh, Tom Abenanti is fighting hard for all of you up in Albany. I do want you to know that I used to have this committee, um, OPWDD, and uh, they split the committees in half. However, I do represent a lot of um, groups that serve the, uh, the DD community. And so I'm very involved. My, my sister is a, peach, a speech pathologist. My niece has a, a degree, a master's degree in special education. I'm a nurse. So I want you to know you can call our office at any time. When there's legislation or if you're gonna come up here and you're gonna make sure that your voices are heard, I'll be standing beside you and my, ver my voice will be loud. So I want to thank you. Um, you know, again, we have to make sure that we have appropriate housing for people with disabilities to make them available when we build new complexes, et cetera. They need to do set-asides for people with mental health and OPWD. It's so, so very important. And also, it's very important for people to be able to have access to a, to a um, to a, an apartment that is handicapped accessible. And I think that we really have to uh, make sure that happens as we go forward, and especially when you're getting state grants. I mean, we're all paying taxes and it's very important that we do that. I'm uh, going off, I have a mental hygiene uh, meeting today. And so I'm going to say my number is 845-794-5807. If you have ideas for legislation, if I'm doing something right, you can call me. But if I'm doing something wrong, or if you have any ideas for me, our phone lines are always open. And we really feel that our best idea ideas for legislation comes from people that are inside that field. And I want to thank you again and again and again for all the work that you have done during this difficult period in the United States and in New York State, and we are here to help you. So thank you so much. Hey, thank you very much, Assemblywoman. Um, it's always a pleasure. And good morning, everyone. My name is Brian O'Malley. Many of you know me, Executive Director of City of Paintings. Um, but as Megan said, we have a busy day and I want to hand it off now to the next legislator we have to speak with you, another great champion, um, someone who understands the importance of government, understands the importance of healthcare, understands the importance of Medicaid, and understands the importance of home care. Um, so without further ado, uh, Chair of the Senate Health Committee, Senator Gustavo Rivera. Thank you, Senator. Good morning, Brian, and good morning, everyone. I know that I saw, did I see Jose Hernandez here somewhere? <laughs> Got one of my constituents in here somewhere. I saw him earlier. So I'll say- I, I see you, Senator. <laughs> there you go. Good to hear from you, brother. Good to see you earlier. Um, so I will, uh, since we have, as I said, a as, as was said, a long day. I am. I'm hoping that this is the last time that we have to do these virtually, and I'm hoping to see your beautiful faces up here uh, at some point soon. Um, but I'm glad that we can still do these advocacy conversations. So I'll keep it brief. Three things that I wanted to to, to talk about today. Well, first of all, I'll say this budget is far better than any budget that I've seen in my legislative uh, career so far, uh, which is a great thing that we have a better place to start from. Uh, but it's obvious that there's still things that we need to do to go further. But at least there's a lot of things that we don't have to go back and fight to get back into a budget because they were cut. Uh, so that is a good thing. Uh, but there are three things in particular that I think we need to talk about. And I know that I've been pushing to make sure that are included in this budget. Number one, that we need to get rid of the Medicaid global cap. Uh, that is something we've talked about for years. Um, it is an artificial method of controlling costs supposedly, but what it meant for years was that services were cut uh, and were cut usually to the most vulnerable. Uh, and so we have to make sure that we get rid of it. Now the governor did recalculate, re, uh, if you will, uh, and the increases to Medicaid this year, as opposed to cuts as we had in, in, in other years. I certainly thank her and her administration for doing that. 
Um, that's a great start, but we have more for far more to go. Getting rid of the cap is number one. Number two, uh, as we remember, the prior administration that I referred to as the departed, uh, he did some things last year. And one of those things was to change some of the eligibility requirements, again, for the sake of saving money. Uh, and we have to, I believe that we need to get rid of that because um, it, it would be uh, it would be unfair to continue down this road of saving money. And I put that in quotation marks every time, saving money uh, for, you know, on the backs of the folks who are most vulnerable. So I believe that those eligibility requirements that were put into uh, that went that were put into effect uh, with the with MR with the Medicaid redesign team two MRT two last year need to go away. Uh, and and last but not least, uh, as we've been talking about fair pay for home care, I, I believe that this is one of the most important things that we could do this year. Uh, and, and one of the things that I have been saying, uh, we are currently in a very good, and we couldn't have said this a few years ago, we're in a very good economic position, which is a very good thing. Uh, so much so that the governor uh, is proposing $9 billion to be put into reserves. Now, having reserves and having a rainy day fund is certainly a necessity and something that I believe in. But if the last couple of years were not uh, just incredibly, you know, in incredibly rainy, I don't know what could be described as a rainy day if we don't consider the pandemic and everything that it has wrought uh, a, a deluge, if you will. So this is the moment I would say, if we can put away just for the sake of argument, if we can put away $9 billion in, in, uh, in, um, in reserves, how about we put $7 billion in reserves and perhaps take some of that money and actually invest it and invest it in things which will give us a positive economic benefit as well as stabilize, for example, in fair pay for home care, the idea that you would pay these workers fairly means that their lives will be stabilized. It will mean that we will have more folks that will probably want to go towards that career or stay in that career. That will mean that the care that they provide to people will also be stable. And this is revenue, this is income that is going to be spent because, because working class folks spend their money. They spend it on food, they spend it on clothing, they get up to date on their rent, all of those things. Would, be, would have a positive economic effect. So I would just say that, again, we have, it is a much better place to be, to be fighting the fights that we're fighting right now, since we have a much better budget than we did in years past. But I would say that uh, I'm looking forward to continuing the fight along with you, because this is the moment where we can actually invest in those things that will provide us long-term stability. Excuse me. And long-term stability, as it relates to services for the most vulnerable, is there is no better place to invest our money than those things. So with that, I will say, again, thank you for being a part of this ongoing struggle. And I'm looking forward to seeing you in person up here in Albany pretty dang soon. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Senator. Um, thanks for just being such a great champion for us. And uh, we look forward to seeing you as well. Um, so moving right along, um, I'm very happy to introduce uh, the next legislator that we have with us this morning. It's someone who came to Albany as a legislator and just, you know, immediately understood. We didn't have to convince her and she just innately knew the value of independent living, the value of home care, the value of living in our communities. And um, we are thrilled that she has joined the New York State Assembly and we look forward to a very long partnership um, with her serving as a champion. So I'm happy to introduce Assembly Member Anna Kellis. So thank you, Assembly Member. Absolutely. So, so, so glad to be here. I'm actually on my way to Albany. I'm going to be as careful as possible driving slow um, so that I can make it there in one piece and continue to do this work. And I just, um, I want to thank you all for, for having me here. Um, this is one of the most important fights that we have this year. I cannot emphasize that enough. Um, 
what we are looking at, I, I'm, you know, people, people know me. Um, I, I always, I'm fascinated by the data. I'm fascinated by the numbers because they really tell such a profound story. And in this case, like nothing I've seen. So I'm just going to throw out some of the things that just stick with me and really impact me emotionally. The fact that we have this, this industry of home health care, uh, health care aides that take care of us in one of the most vulnerable periods of our lives. And yet, um, then half of them are on public assistance. Almost half of them do not have stable housing. And imagine these people who are coming and taking care of other people. It's such a stressful job. It's so intense. And then they go home and they don't have their own stability. And that's what we're doing as a state to these people who we really should be honoring. Um, and so 60% of the people who lead this industry have identified the lack of economic stability as the main reason that they just can't stay in the job, not because they don't like it, not because they're not dedicated, but simply because they can't afford to continue to do the job, which is crazy. So we're coming out of COVID where we have this experience in New York State where you know, 15,000 people died in nursing homes because of COVID unnecessarily, or the 15,000 more than was reported, um, to be clear. And so we have even more people who are saying, I want to age in place, I want to age in, at home. And then we also have people with disabilities who um, do not want to go into a nursing home facility. Uh, it's inappropriate and in, in many cases will separate them even further from society. And so we are continuing to see an increased demand while we have a decrease in, sub, in, in amount of, uh, of our workforce. So the estimate by 2026 is a need of 600,000 new, new workers in this industry, 600,000 new workers in this industry. And unless we have a situation where they are getting paid, let's say as much as people who are working in the fast food industry, right now they're getting paid about on average $13 an hour way less than people in the fast food industry. That is unacceptable. So we have a situation right now, the Fair Pay for Home Care Act would actually increase them to 150% the poverty line, which in and of itself is not enough. But that gives you a sense of how low it actually is. We know that if we put $2.5 billion in as a state, in a budget, sounds crazy high but we have a $216 billion budget for an industry that has been uh, underrepresented and um, undercared for in, in our budgets. If we put 2.5 billion in, the federal government will match. So we will get double that. So we need to remember in life about money smartly to take care of everyone. You have to spend money to make money, they say in business, right? You have to spend money to, to, to care for society and create a baseline. That's all we're talking about here. So I'm not gonna belabor the numbers too much, but this is one of the most stark sets of numbers that I've ever seen. And the, the need is so incredibly great. So everybody who is here know that I'm a champion. Everybody who's speaking today is a champion. Um, you can contact me as well but my heart is here, my heart is with all of you. And um, let's make this happen, let's make it happen. So thank you so much for having me speak today. Great, thank you Assemblywoman Anna Kellis for being such a great champion for uh, fair pay for home care and for uh, you know people with disabilities in general. Uh, and we look forward to working with you moving forward. Um, uh, so. Thank you. So moving on, um, uh, Lindsay Miller, Niles Executive Director, is unable to join us here today in person over Zoom, but she did pre-record a message. So we're gonna uh, play that for you right now.
Good morning, everyone. Uh, for those of you that don't know me, my name is Lindsay Miller. I'm the Executive Director of the New York Association on Independent Living. I'm very sorry that I couldn't be there with you all live today, um, but I do hope that I will get to see you all again in person for this event next year. Um, I wanted to just take a minute to thank you all for participating and for your fierce advocacy today, this week, and throughout the year. The independent living community is starting this year with two significant wins. This year's executive budget included a $2.6 million increase for independent living funding. This is the first time an executive has ever proposed an increase for independent living, and it's no doubt in large part to the strong advocacy from all of you and the support in the legislature as a result of that advocacy. While it's not the total funding ask we had hoped, it's a major win and a significant increase for the network that has been underfunded for so many years. In addition, last week, Governor Hochul signed our bill restoring the Office for the Advocate of People with Disabilities, now called the Office of the Chief Disability Officer, giving a voice to all people with disabilities in New York State and putting the essential functions and mission of this office into state statute. We hope that this is a strong signal of an administration that understands the needs of people with disabilities and wants to work with us instead of against us. However, this cannot be the case unless this year's budget includes fair pay for home care. This is by far the biggest issue impacting people with disabilities and their independence, the aid crisis, and it must be addressed now. I know you're hearing from many speakers today on how important this issue is, and I know that many of you understand it firsthand, whether through your own personal experience, through your loved ones, or in the work that you do on a daily basis. In addition, we're seeing it at the systemic level. Through Niles programs, we are witnessing the real impact low wages is having on people's ability to transition out of institutions and to maintain their independence in the community. Our transition numbers are starting to go down, and we're losing housing units on a regular basis that are already incredibly difficult to locate and secure. This is unacceptable, particularly in light of the recent pandemic and the tragic deaths that we witnessed in facilities as a result. I urge you all to focus on the, this issue in your meetings today, this week, and throughout the budget season. We cannot take no for an answer any longer. Uh, keep up the advocacy. Thank you for all that you do. Uh, and thank you, of course, to CD Pammies for partnering with us on this event on an annual basis. Uh, see you all soon, I hope. Thank you. So, um, again, this is a wonderful event we are able to do with Niall every year. And um, continuing with the, some pre recorded messages, we. Senator May was unable to be with us this morning. However, as our lead sponsor of Fair Pay for Home Care in the New York State Senate, as well as the chair of the Senate Aging Committee, she was did send in a video as well. So, Senator May. Hi, I'm Senator Rachel May. First of all, let me say it is truly an honor to be invited to kick off the 2022 Lobby Day for two amazing organizations that are on the front lines of helping New Yorkers live independent, fulfilling lives. I miss the days of you all crowding into my office, everyone talking at once and bringing so much energy and passion and what Agnes McRae calls extravagant differences to the corridors and elevators of the legislative office building. Speaking of Agnes and her son, Charles, I feel like I see them everywhere in my district and here in Albany, speaking out about fair pay for home care workers, about elect reforms, about the history of the ADA, about so many things. I can't begin to say how many lives they have touched, how many minds they have changed with their advocacy and their example of what truly independent, purposeful life looks like. And then I think of all of you multiplying that impact hundreds or thousands of times. Your activism matters. Your willingness to step or roll outside of your comfort zone and raise your voice for the cause of independent living, of dignity and respect, of paying workers a living wage, all of this matters. 
I know it isn't easy. I know you overcome challenges at every turn that I can barely imagine to get places where your voices can be heard. But please know, we hear you. We see you. We want to learn from you. We want to lift up your stories and your unique experience as we put together the budget and legislation that may affect your lives. Fair pay for a home care. This has been my central focus for the last 12 months. And with the help of the caring majority, I really think it has a chance to get in this year's budget. Working with the caring majority on this campaign has been amazing. Everywhere I go, I hear people talking about fair pay. Every time I venture onto social media, the first thing I see is a post about fair pay. Thanks to the brilliant organizing and careful strategizing of folks like C.D. Panny's own Brian O'Malley, the message has gotten through. More than half the Senate and Assembly are co-sponsors. It is a fully bipartisan bill. People get it. Everyone knows someone who is struggling to find home care. Everyone understands why so many seniors and people living with disabilities would rather have assistance staying at home than move into a nursing home. Most people agree that the work of caring for someone in the home should be rewarded with a dignified wage. This is our moment. The investment New York needs to make to pay home care workers a living wage is large, but the payoff is even larger. Nursing facilities cost Medicaid $160,000 a year or more. Home care costs one twentieth of that. When workers rise out of poverty, the state saves on public assistance costs and gains tax revenue. And when family members can stay in their jobs instead of quitting to care for a relative, that's good for the economy too. And to top it off, we get tens of thousands of people who are happier and healthier living with dignity in their own homes. Fair pay for home care is the right thing to do. And with your help, we're gonna get it done in 2022. Thanks everyone, go get them. Uh, Megan, we, we can't hear you. Oh, geez, thank you. <laughs> um, I just wanted to thank Senator May for being such a champion for fair pay for home care, whether it's the hearing she held over the summer to spotlight the crisis in home care um, or asking strong questions during the health hearings last week. Um, Senator May really takes every opportunity she has to uh, lift up this issue and to fight for us. Um, and she's, she's been a wonderful uh, sponsor and leader on this issue. Um, we have some more uh, pre-recorded messages. So next we wanna hear from the Senate uh, Disabilities Chair, Senator Mannion. Um, this is his second year as chair of the this newly established committee and has really jumped in to try to fight for people with disabilities and is a co-sponsor of Fair Pay for Home Care and has also taken on some other issues, including uh, really taking on access to home, which would uh, which does provide home modifications for low-income people to keep them in their homes, which is uh, another issue Niall um, you know, always advocates for. It's such an important program. Um, so let's uh, turn now to hear from Senator Mannion. Good morning. I'm Senator John Mannion from Syracuse, New York, and I'm thrilled to support home care workers because you all do so much to support all of us. I'm the chair of the Disabilities Committee, and I'm your ally in this fight. I've spoke at the hearings. I've been in the meetings. I've heard your voice and your stories. I know the people that rely on your care and services, and I know all of you. I understand that we've asked too much and given too little in return. Programs like CDPAP are working for New York families and need additional investments so they can continue to grow. Mandatory overtime is not a long-term strategy to fix the workforce crisis. But do you know what is? Better wages, so we can recruit and retain more workers, so we can fortify the services that so many rely on. 
while providing a decent salary and work-life balance for all of you. I'm proud to co-sponsor Senator May's legislation and not just put my name on a piece of paper, but really get in the trenches and fight for it because it's that important. We need Governor Hochul to join us and allocate the billions that are needed to properly pay our home care workers and support the system with the new investments it needs. It's my honor to speak with you, to support you, and know that working together, we're going to succeed and get this legislation and funding over the finish line. Thank you. Great. Um, so thanks to Senator Mannion for sending along that and for the work he is doing um, to support our goals uh, with fair pay for home care and otherwise. Um, next, we want to share a video from Senator James Scoofus. Uh, many of you know Senator Scoofus and possibly from back when he was in the assembly as chair of the assembly's disabilities task force before it became a committee. Um, Assemblyman Scoofus has really championed uh, many things for the disability community, uh, including being the sponsor of the bill that uh, established the Office of the Advocate for People with Disabilities, now called the Office of the Chief Disability Officer. Um, and so we have so much to thank him for, and he has been such a champion for fair pay for home care. Um, so let's hear from him now. Good afternoon, everybody. This is State Senator James Scoofus, and I'm so delighted to send my warmest greetings and some remarks to all my friends in the independent living centers throughout the state, as well as CD Panis, uh, both of whom uh, I've been so privileged to work with over the past 10 years, both in my time uh, in the Senate, uh, as well as previously uh, my time in the State Assembly. And you know, this is going to be a momentous year, I believe, uh, for the issues that we care about. Most namely, uh, finally getting across the finish line, uh, fair pay for home care workers. Uh, this is the year that I believe we are finally going to get it done. Uh, and it's because of all of the work that you all have put in uh, and all of the effort, the ongoing effort uh, that my colleagues and I uh, continue to bring to this ever important issue. Uh, and this is a personal one for me. Uh, later in life, uh, my mom became a home health aide. And this work, I don't tell any of you, is extremely tolling physically, emotionally, mentally. And the folks, the men and women throughout the state who do this work, they do it because they care for and they love uh, the people that are around them and that they take care of. Uh, but uh, in what kind of society do we live in where uh, you can make more money uh, working at a fast food joint than doing this, uh, this human work? this important work taking care of our neighbors. And so I believe finally, this is the year that we get it done. Uh, and I certainly will not stop. And I know you will not stop uh, until we do so. So let's do it. Thanks for all your work and keep pounding that pavement today on lobby day and every single day until we get it done. Sarah Scoofus really has been such a great champion since he his time in the assembly, his time as the disability task force chair at the time there and has continued as such in the Senate. Um, I'm now thrilled to introduce C.D. Paney's newest staff member. Um, Senator Rivera highlighted him earlier, but it is my pleasure to introduce Jose Hernandez who is C.D. Penny's new um, organizer within the New York City area. So, Jose. Hello, everyone. Uh, like Brian said, my name is Jose Hernandez, and I am the newest community organizer, and I'm proud to be here amongst you guys. I see there's a couple of hundred participants, and I'm humbled by that because, you know, it. it usually we're out there and we're advocating and we're usually the only ones in the room and to say that I'm amongst a couple hundred people advocating on the, the same 
topic, it's very humbling to me. And um, I want to thank you guys for attending. Um, I, if I can, I wanted to share a little story about how important home care is to me. You know, I, I wouldn't be here or have accomplished everything that I have accomplished if it was not for my home care. And in my deepest need, when my mother was passing away, it was home care that allowed me to make sure that her transition from this life to the next was as peaceful as possible. And, you know, they deserve a living wage. And that's what we're all here fighting for. So as you go out today and this entire week and meeting with your legislators, you know, just tell your story. They're human beings just like us and we need to humanize what we're going through. So please go out there and just um, tell your story. So thank you very much. And I look forward to working with everyone here and continuing to grow out our grassroots network. Thank you. Thank you, Jose. Um, it is, Jose said it perfectly. And, you know, as y'all go out there, it's, it's your story. It's, it's how home care is impacting you. How, how does home care or the lack of home care impact your life? And why is it that we need to make sure that fair pay for home care does happen this year because we've been fighting for this for too long and the problem has gotten worse and worse every single year. We can't afford to lose this year and we won't. We are putting everything we have into this. Niall is right there with us at every moment, putting everything they have into this. And we have an amazing set of partners across the board from the caring majority um, and our partners at HCP, our partners in agencies around the state, our partners in AARP, our partners in 1199. This legislation has the momentum that I have not seen before in my time here in Albany. And it has the support of every sector because we know that this state can't move forward without a major investment in home care, without the state finally acknowledging that home care needs the support that it deserves. And I want to be clear that level of support doesn't come easily. It doesn't come naturally. It becomes because all of you have been there for the past decade, making sure that your legislators hear about the problems that are out there, hear about the impact that cut after cut after cut from the damaging Medicaid global cap is having. We need to repeal the Medicaid global cap. We need to get the money that is necessary to invest in this program and make sure that we are adequately paying workers so that we can get the services we need, so that we can run our agencies, and so that home care is the service that it deserves to be in our society. It really is a tragedy when folks are out there and can live in the community, can live vibrant lives, but do not have access to the services they need. It is a tragedy when I get phone calls talking about folks who have pressure sores for no other reason than they can't find enough workers. They are going to people are going into hospitals, they are going to nursing homes for no other reason than they can't find adequate home care. It is unacceptable and we will stop it this year with fair pay for home care. 
Senator Rivera spoke about the $9 billion revenue surplus. Well, the comptroller now estimates that that surplus is $20 billion. And the governor would put all of that money in the rainy day fund. Well, guess what? It's pouring. We have a hurricane conditions here in home care. It's, we need that money now. We can put a little less than $20 billion in a rainy day fund and make sure that we have the funds that are needed today. So with that, I wanna take a moment and introduce our next champion legislator. This is someone who does a wonderful, does a wonderful job telling her own care story, telling how home care has impacted her life and has also helped us by ensuring that we know the level of home care need that is actually out there by for by introducing legislation that would force the department of health to actually tell us how many people are using home care and cdpa in this state with that i want to introduce assembly member jessica gonzalez rojas thank you for joining us thank you brian so much uh, and i'm so thrilled to see a interpreter here today with us as well um, first off, thank you all for being here. Thank you for your work. We need to hear your voice. Um, my name is Jessica Gonzalez Rojas. I am a new member of the health committee. Um, I use she, her, Aya pronouns, and I'm so proud to represent uh, Jackson Heights, East Elmhurst, Corona, and Woodside in Western Queens. And I'm so thrilled that you all are here to advocate for fair wages, for the fair pay for home care bill and transparency. Listen, we know this shortage is dangerous. Without anyone to care for older adults and disabled people, our family members will be vulnerable. Um, as Brian mentioned, he's heard me share my story. Um, in 2010, um, I broke my leg snowboarding. Um, I couldn't walk for five months and I had a, a home care worker that helped me do everything from use the restroom to get about my home, to wash dishes, to wash laundry. Um, to really have me be able to still um, be slightly independent and be able to live, quite frankly. Um, so I know how critical these workers, um, th how much they help the lives of um, their patients and, and people that they impact and their families, right? Um, I didn't have to have someone stay home with me because I had a, a worker with me. But right now we're facing some of the most horrific shortages. And in fact, New York is one of the worst in the nation. And our workers are, are struggling. 57% of our home care workers rely on state assistance, including SNAP, including Medicaid. And on the other end, the patients, only 20, 25% have reported that they couldn't find home care workers. And this sector is made up predominantly of people of color. So it is a worker justice issue. It is a disability justice issue. It is a racial justice issue. Um, we have to ensure that we're elevating their pay so that they can live a dignified lives. While they're caring for others, they need to be able to care for themselves. Unfortunately, in the budget, we've only seen bonuses and we know that bonuses are not enough um, to really pay our home care workers um, in a sustainable way. We need to make sure that they make at least $35,000 on average. Um, and I'm also proud to be part of this fight with my own bill because we also need transparency. There's currently no transparency related to service provision and usage of home care services in New York State. So this makes it really difficult to know the number of individuals receiving home care services, the type of home care services being provided, and information about the service usage. Um, so my bill, which is eight, uh, A8173, would require that the Department of Health report on its website the usage of home care services, including the type of services being provided, the average number of hours being authorized, including those type of services, and the type of service by payer and county, right? And this has to be searchable, right? We need transparency um, to, in, in, to ensure that um, we're aware of these um, provisions being provided and ensure that our workers are being cared for. I'm so proud to share that it's already cleared the health committee. Um, it needs to be brought to a vote. It's in ways and means right now. Um, so your work today will really help 
move it over the finish line. So um, my bill in conjunction with the fair pay for home care bill um, will really help um, both our patients and our workers across New York State um, live, work uh, with dignity and justice. So thank you, thank you, thank you. Good luck today. Thank you for your organizing. And I'm really grateful to be here with you all. Um, so excited to see the impact you're gonna have on today's, during today's visits. So thank you so much. Great, thank you so much. Um, this has been great. We've had so many uh, champions join us today to speak about fair pay for home care and other issues important to uh, Niall and CD Panis and our members. Um, I hope that everyone found today inspiring, um, that you're all fired up to go meet with your legislators and speak to them uh, about fair pay for home care and the need to increase wages for home care workers, but also uh, all the other issues we've been talking about, including getting rid of the Medicaid global cap. Um, and, you know, I, I touched on accessible housing and uh, Lindsay touched on increased funding for IL funding uh, for independent living centers. So we know that we have a lot of issues to talk about with our legislators today. I wish everybody um, great visits. Um, and uh, I know you guys all have your materials. We'll look forward to getting feedback from you on how all of your meetings went. Um, I know that CD Panis has a form. I encourage everyone to reach out to, to us as well to let you know, uh, let us know how those videos go, uh, those meetings go, <laughs> excuse me. Um, and uh, with that, uh, Brian, unless you have anything to say, I'll thank everyone for joining and, uh, uh, wish you good luck with all your visits. No, oh, thank you. Thank you, Megan and Niall, and thank you to all the legislators. Yeah. Okay. Take care, all. Thanks for joining us.